We all love our plants, and our cannabis plants play an important role in our lives. When we as humans love something, give it importance, and strive to understand it, we call that sacred. If you want to learn about cannabis health, cultivation, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you new podcast episodes as they come out, delivered right to your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. Also, we're giving away very cool prizes to folks who are signed up to receive the newsletter. There's nothing else you need to do to win except receive that newsletter. So go to shapingfire.com to sign up for the newsletter and be entered into this month's and all future newsletter prize drawings. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Lose. My guests today are Blair and Daniel Auclair. Blair and Daniel Auclair are farmers of cannabis and food at Radical Herbs Farm in Covalo, California. I'll point out that radical is spelled radical like the taproot, R-A-D-I-C-L-E. Blair trained on biodynamic farms, first on Maui and then at Raphael Gardens in Sacramento, located at what was then Rudolf Steiner College. Daniel also started farming in Hawaii before starting an apprenticeship at Live Power Community Farm, a horse-powered biodynamic vegetable CSA located in Covalo. Their paths came together when they met at the farmer's market in Covalo, and from there they embarked on an agricultural endeavor together, getting married and starting a family. In fact, Blair is expected to go into labor any day now, which explains why she sounds a little out of breath in the interview. They are now stewards for 60 acres, consisting of hay fields and about two acres under cultivation of vegetables and cannabis production. In 2018, they won the Regenerative Farm Award at the Emerald Cup with two other farms. Radical Herbs is both Dragonfly Earth Medicine and Sun and Earth certified. Blair and Daniel practice biodynamics on their farm, Radical Herbs, and this year will be featured in a documentary alongside Green Source Gardens and Bryceland Forest Farm. The film titled Tending the Garden is a journey through a year in the life of these three family farms cultivating cannabis, food, and community in the pursuit of a regenerative future. Blair and Daniel practice a sort of farming that embraces both science and mysticism. Today we are going to discuss biodynamics. Special note that the internet isn't very robust out in Covalo, and there are a few minor audio drops in today's show. Welcome to the show, Blair. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Hey, right on, Shango. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much for having us. Happy to be here. Right on. So so let's start by creating a bit of context for folk, because I bet there's a bunch of folks like me who generally think that like biodynamic growing is essentially like organic growing plus magic. And like, you know, that's a little vague, but it, it's also not that far off from what I'm gathering. So, so please like, like set the table for our discussion today by walking us through the philosophy behind biodynamics and a bit about Rudolf Steiner, the father of the practice. Sure. So, um, that's a really great description of it. And, um, Steiner was known, uh, as the scientist of the invisible. And so, he had been working his whole life to establish a uh, a science that would be taken as legitimately as the natural sciences, but one that studied spiritual phenomena as opposed to, or or as it relates to the natural sciences. He wanted there to be a science of the spirit to go alongside the science of matter, the natural sciences. And he devoted his life to that. He was a part of the Theosophical Society back in the day with H.P. Blavatsky. Um, He wrote books. He lectured extensively. He established um, areas of research that changed medicine, pedagogy, economics, architecture, the arts. He had his hands in everything uh, and was a very controversial figure, actually, um, and in his time. Um, but before he left us, he was asked by farmers uh, in Austria to give indications for a spiritual renewal of agriculture. And that's actually what the ag- lectures were originally titled, it's the spiritual renewal of agriculture. Because these farmers, a lot of them, uh, the lectures were given on a sugar beet um, estate. They were noticing... Uh, with the onset of chemical agriculture, they were seeing a decline in soil health, a decline in seed germination, 
and they really were concerned about this and wanted to know what they could do to combat that. And so he gave a series of lectures uh, to that end, and that's where biodynamics has come from. And um, there was an experimental circle that was formed very soon after, and that's what we um, have been working with today. There's a series of preparations that are were given to... Um, using the compost pile, there's field sprays, um, and just ideas of working with the rhythms of uh, moon cycles, and what could Blair say? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good like beginning introduction, and that was those lectures were given in, in 1924, and so this was kind of, s some people see it as like sort of the first uh, kind of written organic guidelines in a way, uh, predating sort of what we know. But we do know that, too, uh, you know, hundreds and centuries before that, people have been practicing agriculture and been doing regenerative practices. Um, it, and it was just sort of in this time that uh, chemical agriculture started to make its way in that there was really beginning to see a degradation in land. Um, but one of the things that Steiner really looked at in looking at a farm was looking at it as sort of this, this living organism that strives to be self-sustaining. And so when you're looking at that, you're looking at, uh, you know, one of the biggest things is how do we reduce the off-farm inputs that we're bringing on into the farm and how do we create fertility on the farm and how do we create this organism that can function and be able to sustain itself without having to bring a lot in and so you know we're looking at not only like growing cannabis growing vegetables but how do we incorporate different parts into the farm as far as like bringing the animal elements in you know we have we have different types of livestock but a way that you can bring the animal element into the farm if you're just even in, in a backyard gardener is to plant some flowers um, to grow some perennials uh, grow some annuals and in that way you're bringing in uh, you know you're bringing in bees you're bringing in pollinators those bring in birds and all of a sudden you have this uh, vibrant thriving animal aspect to the farm. <clears throat> also, um, part of bringing in biodiversity and creating a living organism is building fertility. And there's different ways of doing that. We build fertility by, um, you know, making, making compost, and we definitely still are lacking in our closed loop system and still bring in compost, bring in potting soil, but it's always sort of like a it's a constant goal that we're striving to get better at as is is closing those loops and you don't always have to it's not always about having the animal aspect of making compost and for for fertility cover crops are like an amazing excellent way to bring in fertility to the farm a great way to keep your soil covered in the winter time and kind of closing the loop in that respect and also um, it just, it, it's a great way to also just bring in more plant diversity to your farms. So you're not only just growing like in a cannabis bed, if you're, you know, has a tendency to just, they, you know, people will grow cannabis and then in the winter time, it'll just sit there. Um, but if you're bringing a cover crop in and planting that on your cannabis beds, then you're bringing in more diversity and soil, uh, different soil roots and stuff to to that farm um also as far as diversity like wild places are really important too um in creating this farm organism in that uh, even in the Demeter certification you're required to have 10 percent of your farm at least dedicated to wild areas and we know in those kinds of areas you're you're bringing in a whole dynamic array of different animals and organisms and I think the way that we try to treat our farm in even the places that we cultivate we're trying to mimic wild places as much as possible by having as much diversity of crops you know making sure we have flowering plants and annuals 
annuals for flowers and perennials for flowers and ensuring that there's sort of this constant uh, amount of vegetative growth all the time to encourage a diversity of uh, beneficial insects and pollinators and birds and putting bird houses up and that sort of thing. Um, and then, <clears throat> let's see, as far as uh, the biodynamic preparations, Daniel touched on a little bit, um, and it will go into more detail later in the show. Um, it's kind of one of the more well-known parts of biodynamics is the biodynamic preparation, the horn manure. And it does, one a little bit less known, its counterpart is horn silica. And those two work together in sort of relation to the cycle of the year. Whereas like horn manure is made from uh, putting a manure in a cow horn buried in the winter months and that's sprayed on the soil. Whereas horn silica is also put in the in a horn but buried in the summertime and used as a foliar spray as the plants are ripening and kind of trying to enforce the, uh, amplify the cosmic forces that are um, influencing the plants and so um, in a lot of biodynamics you're kind of looking at that duality of aspects not only in the type of fertilization that we're doing as far as like the horn manure and the horn silica but looking at the rhythm rhythms of the year how the plants and the earth are affected by those rhythms and then also kind of like the 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 cosmic aspects of of the earth and, and the influences of the cosmos on the earth and the plants and so the the plants are really you know creatures that are much more influenced by the cosmos than than we are and so there uh there's a whole um planting calendar that people are familiar with that we'll kind of go into a, a bit later in more detail um but the you know the plants are very influenced by mainly by the moon and well mainly by the sun first and then by the moon and then there's constellations and uh, planets and all those things uh, too. Um, let's see and then there's also there's the biodynamic compost preps and so the compost preps are sort of um, were indications that were given by Steiner in his lectures and they really look at kind of they're really seen as sort of like homeopathic preparations that are used to bring a heightened vitality to the compost pile and those are created and made in order to um, bring different elements and to really create a potentized compost that then can be used on on the land. One of the things that I noticed right away is that this really does sound like um like more of a family farm environment, right? Where where people are going to I don't know, grow humans along the alongside growing their crops. Like when when you're describing like, you know, 10% of a of a wild zone and lots of these flowers and you know, um, you know, uh piles of sticks for birds to live in and hedgerows and like it sounds like a very um biologically complex and abundant area um which which is what I picture when I visit regenerative farms um you know in northern california whereas i don't picture this when i when i see some of the multi acreage farms that are very i don't know more sterile right they've got very long rows and you can see the high fences um for protection and and you can see the the, the heavier tilling equipment and um it, it's it's like like that seems like it would be the antithesis of what you are describing which is kind of like building an agricultural area or a or a home home place on the farm where you can grow flowers and food and humans and animals 
and cannabis. And um, it, ju- it just seems a lot more like a, a, a traditional abundant environment instead of more of a mechanized, sterile growing environment. Yeah, definitely. And I would say, you know, like as looking at growing cannabis too, that, you know, and, and plants in general, they're there absorbing their environment. They can't go to other places to get things. And so, you know, looking at like, what's the type of cannabis you want to smoke? What's the kind of food you want to eat? Where that plant being is located and what it's absorbing has a lot of influence on that. And so are you getting something that's absorbing salt fertilizers and that's what you're smoking? Or are you having something that's growing in in living soil surrounded by other plants and the communication of other plants under the soil and the mycelium and that's what the plant is absorbing and that's what you're ingesting and and experiencing and so i think that that was like a really nice a really beautiful picture um that you painted and i think so much why we love living where we live and the communities that we live in and the other farmers that we're surrounded by is really, you know, I think, you know, not just the community that we're able to create on the farm with diversity, but also, you know, so important to have a community in general with with who we're uh, relating with and, and who we're, you know, in this whole process with, too. Listening to you and Daniel describe the, um, you know, the the uh, uh, embracing of nature and the the coaxing the most out of nature, uh, inviting it to participate with you on your farm, um, it actually sounds a lot like the messages that we're all sharing now in the regenerative cannabis scene. But um, it's interesting to note that that this agriculture and life philosophy, you know, came from the 1920s where they were about to run into agriculture, like industrial agriculture and petroleum fertilizers and, and, you know, the mechanization of, of the, um, of the farm. And, and these folks were having an early reaction to being very unsure and unsettled about that. Just like we are feeling, you know, we've got evidence now why they were right to be unsure and unsettled because now we're at the, we're at the far side of industrialized farming, feeling like, okay, we've seen enough and we need to, we need to circle back to some of the important aspects, um, that, that we've lost. Um, does that is like does that fit in for you with your picture? Because I, I think that there's something more to it. Like obviously there's there's the preps that we're going to talk about in set two or three, but um, but I really feel like um, I mean not not to sound too woo woo, but it actually sounds like your far- your farming and the ways that you go about it are kind of as much of um, ritual and prayer as it is you know, just trying to grow good crops. Yeah, and I would say, you know, I think what modern agriculture has done is taken things apart and separated and tried to create and compartmentalize things. And that's not what nature does. Um, You know, nature works in in rhythms and, and cycles and like, you know, taking the animal away from the grass and then growing the feed over here and then all of a sudden you're having this complete imbalance where you're having to put these chemical fertilizers on on a field to grow something and then you have this overabundance of of waste from the animals and it's just like completely out of balance where we're trying to bring as many things together in one place to have them benefit each other and and work together and then i think where biodynamics takes it another step is trying to create ways to create pictures and imaginations for things that we can't necessarily see or that um, regular science can't um, be able to quantitatively measure. And in that respect, Steiner really was able to create some pictures and imaginations for a whole level of spiritual, elemental, um, things that happen on the farm and in nature 
that we can maybe intuitively feel or um, try to imagine. And so in, in that way, he kind of like took agriculture um, uh, to a different to a different level of, you know, how are the planets influencing the plants? Um, how are the elemental beings working like what are the gnomes and doing to uh, uh, doing on the land and different things like that where we can really um, not even I feel like in a certain sense begin to imagine the different microscopic spiritual things that are happening in the plant word world in the natural world and just try to begin to imagine how all those things are happening like like uh daniel was saying only recently we've been able to um talk at some point I was saying only recently being able to understand what mycelium is doing and how that's able to uh create a communication with with plants and i think that's one thing we try to do in our cannabis beds too and why we do so much companion planting is I think really that there's this whole conversation happening underground between the roots that is really important to have as much diversity as possible. And I don't personally know that. And I think that scientists are just being able to somehow with their measurements, like be able to have an idea that there is something going on. But I think that like also back in the day in 1924 Steiner was able to understand that there is this in, uh, elaborate communication happening with with plants that we um, you know can't really grasp but weren't able to grasp at that time. There's an image that he shares of the farm uh, being an image of a human standing on its head right where the the nerve sense and the the, the thoughts of the plants are happening under the ground and then above ground is the belly and the reproductive organs, so there's like an inversion. So to make sure that the, the nerve sense in the soil is active and alive is allowing for more um, communication to be happening through the plants. And it's a very fun image to work with as you're walking around the belly of the farm and the soil being the diaphragm separating the two. You were making me think of uh, um, of a thing where we want it, science wants us to have weigh, measure, and count to be able to tell if something exists and it's real, whereas anthroposophy and biodynamics wants to replace weigh, measure, and count with levity, rhythm, and quality. Oh man, that that's heavy duty actually. Because and actually to to the I was like sitting here struggling, right? Because I'm like, okay, so is by bi is biodynamics more, um, you know, a strategy for for farm upkeep, or is it a philosophy of living? And I and I realized that it's kind of it's kind of both those plus because. So many of us, me included, um, you know, we're feeling more disconnected from our communities and from, um, you know, nature and from, our, you know, our families. Everybody's so spread out. And, and especially during these quarantine days, it's harder to see each other and everything. And, and this entire way of thinking about agriculture continually comes back to interconnectedness and, um, you know, kind of like a um, a spiritual intent. Like, like I'm go I'm going to do my I'm going to do these things on the farm that I know that are good for the farm because in the end I need to produce food and cannabis so that I can, you know, feed my family. But at the same time, I'm going to do it with a ritualistic intention that somehow makes it more meaningful. It's like it's like taking regular regener regenerative or natural farming and and turning it way up with um with ritual practices to give it spiritual meaning do you think do you think that's a fair assessment i mean i'm new to this so i don't know what i'm talking about but but you hear listening to you talk about it it makes me feel like it's it's all of our bases of natural farming turned up with spiritual practices 
I think you hit the nail right on the head. That's like a, a perfect summary. And um, Steiner even has, you know, also like a, a lecture on festivals. Like he knew that like this community sort of festival spirit celebration um, is also extremely important um, for us, I think, for nature, for the world, and being able to, you know, it's not, it's not just about making money on the farm. It, it's so much more than that. And how can we connect with, with different parts of, of, of being and be more s spiritual creatures? There's an element, a trend to want to say that nature will be fine if we just leave it alone. We're like Humans need to re remove themselves from the equation, but anthroposophy is kind of a way of balancing that out to say like, you cannot remove the human element from, from nature. We are a part of it. And he goes on to say that like in the future, the seasons will will happen less and less unless, until humans recognize their role in it. Like, we need to be a part and be co-creators with nature because nature needs us as much as we need it. And that puts us in a very delicate place of what is our motive? Is it ego-driven to dominate or are we wanting to be fair and equitable and and um with each other and to you know it's a like a, there's a moral element that comes that comes out of this too it really illustrates how this variety of farming <clears throat> and i dare say the two of you then as practitioners of this type of farming you really have to you really have to lead with your heart and with vulnerability, right? Because I can imagine, e even though you get great results on your farm, and even though the preparations that we're going to talk about in the next two sets are very real, and they're about managing nu nutrients and such, um, I can imagine that a lot of this really strikes people as woo-woo, and you have to be a little choosy about who you're going to be vulnerable with, about like how you actually see your, your farm, because you've, you've really described described, um, you know, um, these, the, you use this term imaginations, right? And I'm sure that that's like a term of art from Rudolf Steiner. But, but the way that I take it myself is like, you are, you are intentionally using your mind and your heart and storytelling and imagining and daydreaming and all of this stuff to connect you with the animals and the foods and the, and the natures of your farm. And, you know, that, that's not this it's not entirely popular right now right where everyone's trying to sterilize everything and get everything down to that that great quote that daniel just said about like weights and measures and and scales right where where everybody is approaching not everybody i don't want to be unfair so much of farming is about bean counting now and it's spreadsheet farming where where your kind of farming you know still gets the the bountiful results but somehow it has more more, um, more human meaning and daydreaming in it, and that's that's a pretty that's some radical stuff. It feels biodynamics feels so good because it is so unintellectual, uh, right? Like there's a very like science is like dominating our culture right now with this intellectuality. Biodynamics is dirty. It's unacademic. I feel, and you're right. The uh, when we say imaginations, um, Steiner had the three capital letter I's, imagination, intuition, and inspiration are, the th are, are three components to developing oneself. I think Bob Marley was tuned into it also. He had the I3s, were his backup singers, but um, it's, yeah, it's very much, um, it, oh, I, lost, I've, I went got into the weeds there. It, it is um, very much unintellectual and um, well, I think it just like creating a ima like when we talk about creating imaginations. It's like I, Steiner did give like quite specific indications of types of meditations to do, and actually at night, mm -hmm. um, kind of as a sort of a meditate imagination and meditation to go through your look at your day going backwards, um, like start just 
laying in bed you just start to think about like what you did that day and step by step go backwards and then kind of um, bring it forwards and you take that into your into your dream world and to Steiner too the dream world is also a very important place where we're able to communicate um with spiritual beings and uh the cosmos in a way that we can't necessarily do during the day it sometimes seems like there is a turnoff with biodynamics because there's a new language that needs to be learned like etheric bodies and astral bodies and living warmth and dead warmth and all these kind of things but i would just push back against that and say that the language that we're using is one that we had to learn at the beginning also and so when you take the time to 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 get into why these words were chosen and and whatnot like it it does bring a living quality to farming that for us uh, i guess is um continually inspiring and allow puts us in a place of curiosity um and always it it, it makes us take the broadest view of what's happening as opposed to focusing on what's directly in front we have to see what's directly in front of us but then use as much of our surroundings and open open one's perspective or um perspective to to gain clarity as to like what's happening because everything is connected and so biodynamics for us is a really broad and is a very broad way of uh seeing the world Right on. I really get that idea of the inspiring. Hearing you describe it, you know, my my head goes two places with it. The farm that, as you describe it, it sounds like a, like a like a beautiful beautiful place that is that is rich with smells and animals and and like a very highly expressive um, soil food web, right? And it just it just. It sounds beautiful. It sounds like a beautiful, like Hobbiton kind of place to go, and and it sounds like a great place. And yet, the other side of me is is all like, oh, it also sounds very inefficient. And like that is your whole damn point, right? Is that those efficiencies is what kills human connection? And you are intentionally reaching out to these imaginations and um, and intent when you're making these preparations, so that it builds connections because like that's that's kind of at the core of the whole biodynamic thing right is these connections yeah i mean i mean in many ways i would say that we're also i (laughs) i wouldn't categorize as us as inefficient too i mean as we talk about biodynamics and kind of you know talk about why we're into it so much we also like utilize a lot of different other agricultural practices too and don't see biodynamics as like the only way like um you know as far as our vegetable farming we're really into um no-till uh bio-intensive market gardening which is really like an amazing practice and like all really focused on efficiency and you know trying to grow vegetables with the least amount of uh disturbance to the soil and uh, and least amount of weeds and all this and but we feel like that there then is you know and and regenerative agriculture and and different things but um i think that biodynamics just kind of to me a lot of times biodynamics is sort of just kind of also the icing on the cake and like we're able to do all these other things and then biodynamics we're able to just take it that much further into another realm of relating to and understanding nature and the natural systems around us. I like that idea of infusing meaning into farming by adding these extra aspects. Like you, you mean y'all, y'all are just farmers, right? You've got your, you got your, you know, your, these techniques and those techniques, but you do it in a way that, um, allows room for, for spiritual connection as well. And, um, and you're right. Like even, even I, you know, some of the vocabulary I struggle with a little bit because I'm like, I don't, I don't know what these words mean. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I should, you know, reject the ideas just because some of them feel foreign to me. Um, you know, this is, this is merely an introduction to biodynamics. So just because I don't know the vocabulary, um, you know, it inspires me to learn more instead of to, you know, reject it as, as the other. 
Um, one more question before we go to break. Like, where, where, um, when you're when when you consider your planning of your farm for the season, um, and we'll talk more about the calendar later. But that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking like, like, do you have um, like? like multiple layers of planning for your farm where you're pl- you, you're planning one layer which is the 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 germinating the planting and 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 harvesting of the plants and then you have a second layer which is the ritualistic spiritual practices that you do in in um, in tandem with that, um, how do you how do you plan a biodynamic farm when you're when you when you also want to make sure that you have intention? Because like like I forget to do important spiritual practices in my life just because like I get busy or maybe I have too much caffeine and then and then I'm just like I'm just, I'm just doing my day. It takes it takes effort to be reminded to do these these extra extra spiritual practices that make us feel connected. So so I guess my question to you which I've kind of backed into is is how do you go about reminding yourself to to incorporate the biodynamics more spiritual practices when you're also trying to just do the day-to-day of a farm? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think that's also why I feel like you could I kind of see biodynamics as the icing on the cake of the farm because, you know, we do have to, you, we have to continue running the farm and managing the farm and making sure things are functioning. Um, I'd say also in a certain sense, uh, those practices and kind of learning about it is done in a biodynamic way in that it often it's, it can be a bit, Things are kind of structured in a seasonal way, like the preps are made at different different times of the season, uh, different times of the year. But then also like the winter time is a much more inward, slow time where we can kind of like slow down and be able to do some reading and do kind of more of that inward inward work as opposed to just this, you know, being outside trying to get everything done. And um, I also just wanted to to touch on what you were saying about, you know, kind of the accessibility of of the vocabulary and, and learning about biodynamics. I wouldn't necessarily recommend somebody who uh, knows nothing about Steiner and anthroposophy to, like, pick up the agriculture lectures uh, because it can, it's, it's not an easy thing to read. And he did give the lectures to a group of people who already had kind of like understood a lot of his other, um, uh, practices and things. So there was a certain level of like who he was delivering that to, but there is a really great book, um, called culture and horticulture. That's by, um, Wolf Stoll, is that her Stoll? Storl? Wolf Storl. D. Storl. Um, it's called Culture and Ag- Agriculture, A Philosophy of Gardening yep. and... Culture uh, and Horticulture. Sorry, Culture and Horticulture. And it really does an excellent job of like making the concepts really simple and understandable to, uh, to, to understand and a really great introductory book to, to biodynamics. Fantastic. Well, then uh, I will look that up myself, and um, and that is that is a good point that the um, you know some of these terms of art in any advanced discipline is kind of like a secret language, and not to let that be off putting. So, all right. So I think that I and you and everybody listening is very excited about learning more about these spiritually enriched farming practices. So so let's go ahead and go to our first commercial and we will be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire and my guests today are regenerative cannabis farmers, Blair and Daniel Eau Claire. Once you've discovered the benefits of using cannabis, it's a very small step to start making your own edibles, gummies, lotions, tinctures, and concentrated oils at home. Magical Butter has been helping cannabis consumers become self-sufficient for over a decade. With the easy-to-use Magical Butter Countertop Botanical Extractor, you can create high-quality cannabis products to your exact specifications at a fraction of the cost of store-bought edibles. I talk a lot on this show about the importance of home-growing so you don't have to rely on others to feel healthy. 
Well, the magical butter machine can empower your personal health by putting you in control of how you use cannabis in your daily life. I've been making my own butters and oils on the stove for years, and I much prefer the ease of using the magical butter machine. I just set it and walk away. With the simple touch of a button, the magical butter machine grinds, heats, stirs, and steeps your herbal extract all at the correct time interval and temperature for the perfect infusion every time. As a result, you achieve your desired infusion easily, safely, and consistently. Check out the Magical Butter Instagram to see the machine in action. And don't feel like you have to go it alone. There is a huge community on Facebook called Magical Butter Users United, sharing recipes and best practices so you can learn at your own pace from others who are already doing it successfully. Now is the time to get your own Magical Butter machine and save money while enjoying cannabis. Use the discount code SHAPINGFIRE, one word, no caps, to get 10% off. Visit MagicalButter.com today. One of the challenges with buying autoflower seeds is that often you'll have as many different phenos as you will have seeds in a pack. That can be fun, sure, but so many varieties in one pack is a sign of an immature seed line that hasn't been worked enough. I prefer my autoflowers to be worked enough that each pheno in the pack really captures the aspects that the breeder was intending. This is why I recommend Gnome Automatics to my friends and listeners who grow automatic flowering cannabis seeds. Gnome Automatics seeds are not just crossed and released. They are painstakingly sifted again and again, tested in a wide range of conditions, and taken to a level of maturity that each plant will be recognizable by its traits. Traits that were hard-earned so that you can have your best growth cycle ever. Gnome Automatics became a trusted and loved brand in cannabis over the last 10 years as Mandalorian Genetics and recently changed their name to Gnome Automatics. The only thing that has changed is the name. Founder Dan Jimmy continues to pour his passion of breeding cannabis into every variety he releases for you to grow. Check out the Gnome Automatics Instagram at gnome underscore automatics to see the impressive plants folks are growing. You can score Gnome Automatic seeds in feminized or regular at your favorite seed provider listed in the vendor section of their website. Farms interested in bulk seeds of more than a thousand should reach out through the website too. While on the website, be sure to check out the Gnome Automatics shirts and other merch section. If you want reliable seeds, hand-built from effort, expert selection, and experience, choose Gnome Automatics. For decades, Americans have enjoyed cannabis flowers in joints and bongs and bowls. And now, with the normalization of cannabis use increasing across the country, we have the opportunity to enjoy smoking cannabis luxuries that simply were not attainable before. North Coast, hand rolls, blunts, Cannons, rosin infused donuts, and canagars available in the state of Michigan. North Coast focuses on flavor over everything else. Instead of growing their own flower, North Coast goes out into the cultivation community and creates relationships with the best growers working with the best new cannabis varieties available. Surely, heavy THC is a factor. But North Coast focuses on aroma, complex terpene profiles, and taste that continues throughout the entire smoking experience. The North Coast team curates flowers like others curate art. They seek out the best talent, build relationships, helps them take their product to the highest levels, and then buys their well-cured flowers in order to hand-roll them just for you. I really like their hand-blown glass tips. And North Coast has branched out beyond Canagars into rosin solventless THCA diamonds and exceptional hash rosin carts for on-the-go cannabis connoisseurs too. North Coast provides you with attainable luxury, offering you an ultra-premium smoking experience at a price that seems reasonable and repeatable. To find out more about North Coast's line of cannabis products, visit their Instagram at northcoast.rolling. That's northcoast.rolling. And when in Michigan, ask for North Coast at your favorite shop, North Coast. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I am your host, Shango Lose, and my guests today are regenerative cannabis farmers, Blair and Daniel Eau Claire. 
So, so let's segue into the biodynamics calendar because for me, this is, this was how I first got turned on to biodynamics. And I, and I got to admit, it, I didn't have the most positive response to it right away. I'm like, why am I, you know, germinating seeds with the moon cycle and stuff? It like, you know, how I was brought up, um, was much more mechanical farming. And, um, and, you know, now, of course, I understand, um, the interplay between nature and, and, um, you know, friends have explained to me, small parts of why we um, germinate, you know, at certain times of the year, which I'm not going to try to explain because you're about to. Um, but uh, but I'm excited to get to know more. So, um, you know, normally when we think about, you know, farming with the calendar, we're thinking about weather, right? Just like, is it, you know, when's the last frost and, and when does it get like the hottest time of the year? And when do we have to be prepared for drought? And, and that's all true. But in this idea that you presented during the first set of of kind of going beyond the basics of farming to this embracing of nature being alive, there's this entire biodynamics calendar that exists that is supposed to guide us um, for for most of the attributes or most of the actions that we take during farming. So so please dive right into that and give us an example of working through a, a calendar year of, of the biodynamics calendar when it comes to cannabis. Yeah, sure. So um, I think one of the, you know, one of the biggest things I think you really brought up, just comparing like the biodynamic calendar to like farming with weather, like we can, you know, we can make those decisions of how we farm according to weather because we have legs and we can walk outside or come inside. But, you know, plants are very much like weather is weather all year round. They are kind of like subject to to whatever is going on. And, and the same with, you um, as sort of uh, and beings who are in the ground, um, constantly having the world and the uh, uh, the earth move around it, and being affected by the by the planets and the the cosmic beings in in our solar system, and so the biodynamic calendar um, it originally wasn't something that Steiner did. It was actually created by um, a woman, Maria Thun. And so um, it wasn't indications given by Steiner, but she was definitely, she was a, a, a German biodynamic farmer. And she did many experiments in trying to see sort of like the qualities of of what the elements of the earth and how that affects and the and the constellations and the moon and the planets and how that affects um plants um so the, one of the things uh, that it does the way that it's sort of organized in many ways is by the the constellations uh, by the zodiac and not in the way that we kind of look at it in traditional um sort of astrology where the constellations are divided evenly into like 30 degrees the the constellations in the biodynamic calendar are divided by um kind of their width and distance that they have um in the <clears throat> um in the year and so they take up different amounts of time so it's not like uh um, <clears throat> like Aries takes up, uh, you know, a different amount of space than, than Taurus and Gemini. And so the basis of how those things are, are indicated is more, uh, by the lunar cycle as the moon is passing through these constellations within a month it passes through these constellations for different amounts of time. And then each of those constellations are related to an, an element, fire, earth, air, water. And each of those elements are then related to uh, different aspects of, of the plant and sort of which part of the plant you are looking to cultivate or looking to grow. So like the fire element is related to fruit. So if you're trying to grow a tomato, you would be looking at the calendar and seeing how or where the moon is in an element of of a, a fire planet or a fire constellation, which would be Aries, Leo, 
and sat and uh, Sagittarius and so um, the same would be for so if you're trying to cultivate a root plant that would be the earth element and that would be something like a radish or a potato or something that you're trying to cultivate for root and so you would be looking at like where the moon is in those constellations and you know there's not like something you have to go in and figure out and discover there's calendars that are made that you can purchase um, our favorite one is the Stella Natura calendar um, but you can also get uh, there is a Maria Toon calendar as well um, and then the same so for cannabis we would be looking more at the air elements and so that would be because that's related to flower and then if you're say growing lettuce or something or kale or leafy greens that would be related to the to the water element <clears throat> and so um, if you're looking at the calendar you it would it would tell you at different times of like the moon it's usually around like three two three to four days um, depending on the length of and the size of the constellation as the moon is passing through it uh, would be like okay um, you know on these days the moon is passing through um, let's say so uh, so for cannabis the moon is passing through an air sign like Gemini uh, for a couple days you may want to like that would be the time that hopefully it would also relate to um, that would be the time that you would start you know that you would want to do something with the cannabis that being said that would be I feel like on the more like strict side of things that you're constantly trying to do things when a certain uh, when the moon is in a certain constellation reflecting that that energy for us as we as we have practiced things um, we have found that it's more in, we look at more of the larger cycles um, as far as like the moon full moon and new moon and waxing and waning as far as how we relate to <clears throat> To planting and growing um, we find that it has it can have a tendency of just like trying to run a farm and trying to do the daily work of like managing things and doing stuff that like we don't recommend really like tr trying to live your life by these planting calendars I think it um, more than anything it also just like we've talked about creating imaginations and visualizations of things and kind of like looking at you know the constellations and the moons and the planets like they do have an effect on the plants and it kind of gives a, a picture and a guidance to like that that can have an effect but you're not gonna like damage something or you know or do something like really uh, really poorly if you're not going to be like following the calendar strictly and so I think it's important always to have that um, context that I think that it can feel a little bit like uh, sometimes I feel like like you're following a textbook in a, in a way like you said like it's kind of can be a turn off because it's like oh I got to do this then or that then and it's kind of like a bit a bit restrictive and in my experience and um, and I, Daniel will talk about it too. I feel like it really helps to just create pictures for this like whole other level of connection that the that the plants have to its environment and to the cosmos that we can maybe only begin to imagine or understand. And so. Um, I think for me that's kind of like the uh, the planting calendar and I, I Daniel and I have both you know apprenticed on a few different biodynamic farms and as far as like our teach at least for me my teachers um, my, one teacher liked to say that there's the tunes and the untunes <laughs> like the people who are into Maria tunes and her and her planting calendar and the ones who don't really uh, abide by it and so I think as far as like that is usually the first thing that people are introduced to in biodynamics and 
it's actually not even part of the Demeter certification to plant by the calendar. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my summary of it. Daniel, you have anything to add? No, that was really awesome. Um, like you were saying, uh, f the new moon and full moon cycle is kind of more what uh, we kind of go by. I will say, though, if there's a day where everything is just kind of like, oh my god, I need some direction, like, what should we do? It is helpful to say, alright, where's the moon right now? And like, oh, it's a root crop. Let's go weed the carrots. Let's go cultivate, like, and it, get, it does provide some kind of framework to work with. But, um, it seems like the, for us, the, you know, sowing seeds as close to the new moon as possible, um, especially coming into the new moon, definitely not, like, after the first quarter, like, after, when it's waxing. But around that time is great for seed germination because it gives the seeds time to get their radical out, get established in the soil, and then by the time the moon is up and bright, the first cotyledons are, are able to absorb that light, and, um, and that seems to work really well. And then we also use the full moon as a time to... If, if weather permitting, to spray the horn manure preparation, because at that point, the full moon, as we know, it affects all the water, watery element of the earth, and so it's a, a really good time to get that spray happening in, onto the soil so that it can be utilized at that, at that time. And same with transplanting. Um, when the moon is dark, it's better for the seeds to get put um, the transplants to get put into the ground so they can establish their roots and not be too overstimulated um, at night. So at first, you know, when you were describing it, I was thinking, oh, this is this is really much more about um, of, the, of the ritual of the farm and to creating a context to give farming more meaning. But then you just flip the script on me again and you're like, oh, well, actually, you know, when when you germinate is is related to, um, you know, the 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 additional brightness of the moon and and the I don't know, the swelling of the water being pulled up you know and then and then with transplanting you want them darker so it sounds to me like there's actually a combination of both there is this there is this kind of like um um s belief framework um that is connected to the constellations which for some farmers it will give the entire dance of the season more meaning but also um there are very real reasons behind my much of it, um, where the the planetary bodies, which we know have effects on Earth, are actually going to be influencing our crops. Yeah, definitely. And I think you know the the biggest influence, the biggest planetary body that is that the plants are influenced by is the sun, right? That's like the larger kind of like everybody knows the sun is influencing the plants and their growth cycle. And then I would say the secondary one is the moon. And that one often I feel like if you are sort of like really paying attention and really in tune, you can you can um you can definitely see when like a full moon in spring and you're like all oh, those weeds were like an inch big and holy moly there how are they 5 <laughs> inches now and we got to get them out of here or something like that. And so those I think those we can also we can definitely also visually see um, really when you're really paying attention, and then also just incorporating into like those examples that that Daniel was giving, um, and then um, as far as like as far as like harvest goes too with cannabis, I think it's a bit more challenging often, especially for an outdoor operation, because you're kind of a bit more subject, I feel like, at least where we are, to weather and sort of timing, um, just trying to, to, to get things in because it takes such a long time to harvest and kind of getting everything in on time and making sure there's not a frost or a rain. We're kind of a bit more like can't necessarily really follow the calendar um, in that respect. But then, you know, the, the sort of the, the planetary kind of like constellation influences are those much more imaginative and you could say kind of clairvoyant aspects that Steiner was really um, 
you know, he didn't develop this, but just in general, that kind of philosophy of those ideas that we can't really yet see, but but a, a picture to help understand and grasp them a little bit more. For folks who are not familiar with the clairvoyant aspect, would you just explain that a little bit? What is what is this experience of clairvoyance and how does it relate to biodynamics? Clairvoyant, I guess, is a, a seer, right? Someone who um, can read the script, so to speak. Um, I, I don't. We weren't saying we're clairvoyant, uh, but Steiner um, certainly was, and I guess he would maybe describe that as like reading the Akashic record, um, kind of like the big the big movie reel in the sky, so to speak. Um, but he was able to. Um, that's where all these indications came from. Um, the the speaking of elements as carriers of spirit, or that there's this uh, interaction from the cosmos to the earthly realm that um, that permeates all of biodynamics. So, am I? What more could I, like? What are we saying? about clairvoyance? So is that a good description? Yeah, that works. That works just fine. I like this idea that you said of the, uh, you know, reading the big movie script in the sky, right? The, it's the idea of, of being aware that there is a storyline to life and a storyline to the seasons and be, being aware of that instead of just, um, uh, bean counting and running the farm as a business. So, uh, yeah, I think that sounds, uh, uh, like a great description. So let's move on to the individual compost preparations. And, um, I know that a lot of the, the natural Natural farming people who are here for the preparations, less so much the the philosophy, are, are probably glad that we're moving on to this. Um, and and um, you know, a lot of people claim to have fantastic results with both these individual compost preparations and the spray preparations that we're going to be talking about in the third set. So, um, so my my general understanding of how these work is that um, uh, uh, biodynamics believes that you should be treating your compost piles with particular preparations of a very um, specific group of of herbs and and they do they do a, they do a certain job on nutrients in the pile so so I'm not going to try to explain it myself since this is not my specialty but but why don't you take us down um, the path of these individual compost preparations um, how to make them and 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 what their roles are on the biodynamic farm yeah I'll start I'll start with the caveat first instead of going into details and ending with a caveat at the end but I would just wanted to say that you know we've been both been practicing biodynamics for quite a while and this past year was the first year that we actually made all the preps on our farm. And we've always done it in, in community in community groups. And it's not it's not an easy thing to do and it's not like a it's not something that's like easily achievable. And um, you know, a big reason that we or at least for me, like that I kind of also fell in love with this area of Northern California and stuff was uh because of the um BDANC, the Biodynamic Association of Northern California, and uh, the quarterly meetings that would happen winter, spring, summer, fall, where we would make the biodynamic preparations together. And then those would be um, kind of uh, taken care of by one of the practitioners, um, one of my, te my teacher, Harold Hoven, and then you could buy the biodynamic preparations from the organization. And there's other places to buy them. Also, there's a really uh, strong biodynamic group in Oregon, and um, I believe uh, there's a strong one in Colorado, and there's also uh, a few on the East Coast. And so, like, in us describing these, like, I just don't want to feel like people have to feel like, it, oh, that's too crazy, that's too hard, I can't do that. I think they're really made supposed to be done in community, and. And also that, you know, they, they can be purchased from the Pfeiffer Center and, and different organizations, too, that you don't have to make them on your own. Um, so that's just my first little thing I wanted to say. And then Daniel can go ahead and explain the preps. All right. That was really good. Yeah, JPI, Josephine Porter Institute, is another one. Yeah. Can you say that? Um, 
So, the the preps are discussed in the third lecture, and in that he starts off by wanting to talk about nitrogen and nitrogen's role in farming, um, and he brings up the what he calls the four siblings of nitrogen, which is carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur, which is what makes up proteins. And so, like we had said early on, wanting to work with living chemistry, like being able to bring living uh, elements into the farm as opposed to working with uh, synthetically derived elements, he brings up uh, different plants that have certain relationships to certain elements. And so starting from a place of recognizing an active interplay of spirit and form, uh, spirit manifesting in the earthly realm on a carbon framework, there's um, the elements attach themselves to this carbon framework in different ways. And so, start wanting to make compost, which is a great thing that can be done on farm, which alleviates a lot of issues with uh, with plant diseases and whatnot by providing the soil and the and the biome within the soil food, the compost being food for the microbiome, we want to make certain elements available to the plants as best we can. And there are people who are creating more preparations still out of their own observations, but the ones that he uh, starts off with is um, the, the preps are the plants that are used in the preparations are yarrow, chamomile, nettle, oak bark, uh, valerian, and dandelion. And like Blair said, this being the first, this past year, the first year that we were ab able to make the element, the, the preparations on our farm, that's not to say that we weren't growing all the prep plants on our farm. And I think that that has been a really good uh, teacher for us and a way of getting a real good authentic connection to these plants like we have yarrow growing everywhere um, there's dandelion popping up all over uh, chamomile we continue to make more beds of chamomile even though they volunteer every every year um, so growing the plants and living amongst them and using them for teas and whatnot to just gain an accustomed uh, to them is a great way to start but what he's saying here is that by harvesting these plants and putting them in a, a vessel uh, and putting them in the earth to, uh, to absorb forces and to potentize them then become medicines that we can put into our compost pile to enliven the compost. Um, and so let, we can start with Yarrow. And these were given numbers when they came to the New World. I, the story that I am familiar with is that uh, it was said that the Americas would not take these things seriously if they didn't have a number attached to them. Uh, so I forgive me if I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but to speak about Yarrow, he says that the you know the nature spirits reached the highest the the height of perfection in their use of sulfur with with Yarrow. And so there's the carbon framework that the plants are composed of, and then you have these elements that attach to them in different degrees. Um, so the yarrow being put into the bladder of a deer, you enhance its inherent ability to combine sulfur with other substances, and sulfur being a, you know, a really important part of plant health. Um, chamomile is uh, also has homeopathic amounts of sulfur, uh, but it works on calcium in addition to potash. So that that is also a way of keeping plants healthy. Chamomile goes into intestines. Um, so the way the vessels were chosen uh, is very interesting. Um, antlers are different than horns. Uh, when we talk about the horns of a cow, which the... Um, I'm getting off topic a little bit, but the horn manure preparation, we see the manure going into a horn because the horns are a way of reflecting energy back into the animal, whereas antlers on a deer have more of an outstreaming force, and there's a rela relationship to nitrogen there in its surrounding areas. That has a relationship 
to the bladder. The nitrogen being a very present uh, component of urine. He even says that a bladder is the is a perfect uh, description or uh, image of the cosmos. But Yarrow being put into a bladder uh, gets hung in a sunny spot all summer before getting buried into the uh, the earth over the winter. Uh, chamomile has a relationship to intestines, and we know this from just how chamomile tea is great for um, digestion. Uh, nettle is one that does not have a uh, nettle does not have a vessel, although some people are experimenting with um, putting it in the um, what's the sheath of the heart? Um, the, per the pericardium. So, nettle being the greatest benefactor of plant growth, it, it too contains sulfur, uh, assimilates and incorporates, um, a sulfur which assimilates and incorporates the spirit, but currents of potash and calcium are also present in uh, nettle. Iron is the one that we're after with uh, the nettle preparation. Uh, this one gets buried a whole year, and it is infusing intelligence for the soil. Now, in order to, for wanting health on the farm, we need to have a very broad view of interrelationships. And calcium is a great medium for in making those relationships. Um, you can almost never have too much calcium in your soils. Um, the oak bark is one that is put into the skull of a domestic animal, and it, again, this is like very important that we are choosing um, in a, a situation like this, we wouldn't want to use lime, we want to use calcium from a, a living source. Um, oak bark being uh, a, a material very high in calcium. Moving on to uh, the, the dandelion preparation. This is like the language that he uses is, is really beautiful. Um, I would encourage people to, to uh, try to read the lectures. Um, dandelion is said to be a messenger from heaven that mediates the homeopathic distribution of silica and the cosmos. The dandelion goes into the mesentery, which is the, um, what the intestines are encased in, in the animal. And, you know, I don't really claim to understand all of this stuff. I guess, let me just say here that working with the preparations is a great practice of keeping your mind in a, in a question like having more questions than answers, and and I, I've said this before, but like when you think you know all the answers to something, that's a very dangerous place to be in um, because there's a lot of different elements involved. So when we work with these things, I'm constantly wondering what we're doing, but that's a really great place to be as you can receive kind of insights uh, that you wouldn't expect. Um, s silica is a very important element in in our practice and dandelion has a great relation to silicic acid and is said to be able to attract silicic acid from the atmosphere and make available to the plants. Um, lastly, valerian is one that uh, does, does not get a vessel, does not get buried, but is Crush is pressed valerian flowers, which has a, a great way of stimulating phosphorus. And so, once these preparations are made and they've gone through the proper um, burial and process, they get added to the compost pile. And the if we the more we work with compost and the layering of plant materials from our farm, manures, straw, bedding, leaves, gathering uh, seaweeds, putting all these things together, you're creating a raised 
um, you're you're creating a almost a living being, so to speak, and you're forming chaos. Within that compost pile, there's gonna it's going to heat up, things break down, uh, it becomes um, microbiologically alive. Adding these preparations is said to help to almost act as antenna to help bring form to the chaos. Uh, chaos is a word for potential. It, you know, it's not uh, a bad word. When things are in a state of chaos, they are open to influence, especially cosmic influence. And adding these preparations is a way of helping to guide the prep, the compost pile to a healthy decomposition and bringing the different elements that we need for healthy plant growth and soil biology to interact with each other. So um, each of these preparations sound like they take quite a long time. Um, uh, even even the unvesseled ones sound like it can be time consuming. Is is the idea generally that you would make um, these compost preparations this year to apply to next year's compost piles, or or is it not? Does it not really take as much time as it sounds, and you can actually use them same year? No, that is correct. It, the it's. The work that you do one year is for the benefit of next year. And some of them take longer than, than others, like um, some take a, whole, a full year, whereas others are just buried over the, the winter. Um, and so it is said that the earth is the most alive in the winter time, and that can seem backwards, but it's an in-breath that's happening um, the crystal, crystalline forces are, are happening inside the earth at that time. And it is kind of said that in the summertime, the earth is dreaming in plants. Like the sun is actually putting the earth to sleep and it is dreaming in plant life. It is like, it, it, it has to, like the seeds have to germinate. They have to, um, whereas in the wintertime, the earth is within itself. And it gets a little complex with northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere. Uh, that is discussed in some lecture, other lectures from the agriculture course. But, um, and it should be said too that the amounts that are used in the compost pile is very minute. It, it almost can sometimes seem like it's you're not even like how can this little bit of preparation make a difference in this compost pile? So you, it is possible for the if you make. Um, you can make more than one year's worth uh, in the fall. Does that make sense? For sure. Uh, so you're gonna you're gonna make them for this year, but you're gonna make enough not only for yourself for the next few years, but also to share because um, I get that whole community vibe. Trying to do all let's see one two three four five six of those. Um, all by yourself on your same farm with it, like that sounds like very time consuming but if you've got a bunch of farms that are doing this um everybody can make them one season and then and then share them um at the grange hall or wherever and then um then everybody's got enough to last them a few years so that that makes sense both on a um you know a nutrition stabilization uh level for the compost pile but also for the i don't know the spiritual every Everything that was alive in our community, connecting of humans and families, also. For sure, it's it also happens like very close to harvest time, so it can be like very inconvenient to make to have to make the preparations. <laughs> and you need a cow, so yeah. not very many people have a cow to butcher. An expendable cow, at that right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can I can imagine the um, the 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 biodynamic supply store gets pretty weird sometimes. <laughs> so so let's go ahead and take our uh, let's go ahead and take our second commercial, and we'll be right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and my guests today are regenerative cannabis farmers Blair and Daniel Alclair. We'll be right back. For years, organic cultivators have been looking for a peat moss replacement. Peat moss has long been the go-to soil amendment for water retention and container growing, but organic growers are recognizing now that peat moss is an unsustainable resource, and the mining of peat bogs destroys wetland habitats and releases sequestered carbon. But peat moss works so well that many have continued to use it. Now there is finally a revolutionary replacement for peat moss that provides better benefits while being a sustainable choice. 
Pit moss sounds and acts like peat moss, but instead of being mined from fragile ecosystems, is actually made from upcycled organic paper and cardboard headed for landfills. Pit moss is excellent at retaining water in your substrate and creating air pockets and tiny living environments for microbes. Pit moss instantly increases aeration, nutrient absorption, and water conservation too. Carefully and locally sourced, Pit moss is the result of decades-long research into the use of recycled paper fibers. Pit moss is lightweight and easy to use, and pit moss is inert, so it won't change your pH. Available in a range of preparations, including a nutrient-enhanced blend and an organic soil conditioner with no added nutrients. Pit moss is also available as an animal bedding for horses, chickens, and small animals. You can save 15% with the discount code SHAPINGFIRE, one word, no caps, when shopping on pitmoss.com. So go to pitmoss.com now to learn more. That's P-I-T-T-M-O-S-S dot com. Growing healthier, stronger, more sustainable plants. Pitmoss. As cannabis regulations become more demanding and consumers become more educated, it is increasingly important to avoid the use of chemical pesticides when cultivating cannabis. Beneficial insects have been used for decades by the greenhouse vegetable and ornamental plant industry, and today many cannabis cultivators are moving from sprays and chemicals to beneficial insects. Copert has the beneficial insects, mites, and nematodes, microbials, sticky cards, and air distribution units you need to partner with nature to defend your garden. Whether you manage acres of canopy or have a simple grow tent in your home, Copert is ready to help answer your questions and help you transition away from chemical sprays towards clean and natural solutions. Since 1967, Copert has assisted growers in identifying pests and devising reliable solutions while providing healthy insects and mites that will protect your yield. Since the 1990s, Copert has been a leader in cannabis pest and disease control worldwide and have highly trained consultants to assist you in Canada and the United States from coast to coast. With their global network of grower support, Copert can help. Visit copert.com, choose your country, and get detailed information. That's copert, K-O-P-P-E-R-T dot com. For the most up-to-date cannabis-related biological control information, you can also check their Instagram at Copert Canada. You know getting away from pesticides is good for health and good for business, and Copert is ready to help. Visit Copert.com today. One of the reasons why no-till cannabis growing is so valued by farmers is because the mycelium networks in the soil remain established from year to year. And we know these fungal networks are essential because they are the nutrient superhighways that extend far and wide in the substrate to feed your plants. The trouble with growing in new living soils or blended cocoa substrates is that it takes most of the plant's life just to create these mycelium highways. Dynomyco endomycorrhizal fungi inoculant reduces that time and gets your plant eating a wider array of nutrients faster and it's three times the concentration of the other popular brand in the U.S. at 900 propagules per gram of two fungal species selected specifically for cannabis cultivation. Dynomyco is the result of 30 years of research and trials at the Volcani Agriculture Research Institute in Israel. It has also been vigorously trialed by cannabis and food growers across the U.S. Dynomyco is now available at grow shops and on Amazon in the United States. I love using Dynomyco to both speed up the growth of the mycelium networks in the soil, but also as a biostimulant to make clone cuttings more virile. You can see side-by-sides showing the comparative growth on their Instagram at Dynomyco. If you demand reliable growing results and appreciate the importance of an active root zone in creating a thriving plant, I encourage you to check out Dynomyco.com and use the store locator to find out where you can get yours. That's D-Y-N-O-M-Y-C-O dot com. Shaping Fire listeners can get 10% off any size of Dynamico on Amazon or Dynamico.com by using the discount code SHAPINGFIRE, one word, no caps. Whether you are starting with new beds or pots, or if you want to add some zing to tired soil, choose Dynamico to maximize your plant's potential. Dynamico Endomycorrhizal Inoculant.
Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I am your host, Shango Lose, and my guests today are regenerative cannabis farmers, Blair and Daniel Eau Claire. All right, it's the big finish here with set three. We're getting to the part um, that is probably uh, almost as popular as the biodynamics calendar when people talk about biodynamics, and that is these uh, these spray preparations, and we're going to start specifically the, mo- the one that people talk about the most, which is the, the horn manure and the horn silicone spray preparations. And, um, you know, this was the number one thing that I heard people talking about, about um, at uh, Emerald Cup two, uh, I guess it's probably been three years ago now, um, in the regenerative area, the horn manure preparation demonstration is like, I probably heard about that for like an entire year afterwards, people talking about how interesting and engaged and how like, they're like, oh my God, there's so many more aspects to learn. And so I'm excited about learning this myself because I actually missed that presentation. So let's start with that. If you would, please explain the, the, the horn uh, preparations um, and, and, and how to do them. Sure thing. Well, that's very interesting to hear. I think that would have been um, us that was there given that presentation. And um, the, the horn manure preparation is really one of the most fun uh, aspects of of biodynamics for me, I feel like, and it's a really great way of engaging with your land. Um, In in this thought, uh, in the way biodynamics is presented, in the way we start to visualize the farm, like, it's, we have to understand that the, um, the plants that we see on the earth are said to originate in the farthest reaches of the cosmos. Plants only exist because of the earthly realm, and they are a mirror, so to speak. Like plants, the archetype of the plant is radiating out from dist- from the distant cosmos and manifesting on the earth, being reflected back. And so, if you think of the, that gives us a periphery and center image, and we want the plants to be able to fully express themselves and uh, and engage with the earth and be earthbound as best they can. So, a way of doing that, and of enlivening the soil to allow for that connection to take place, there is a field spray that is done throughout the spring and in the uh, wet part of the year where there can be a the water allowing for um, the soil to receive the spray, but you're taking the manure from a cow and putting it into the horn of a cow. And that image, if your imagination will allow you, paints a picture of opposite ends coming together. You have form on the on the one side of the with the horn and you have formlessness the manure from the other end being brought together then that is put into the earth over the winter time to absorb the the forces streaming down into the earth from the cosmos throughout the winter um, and all the activity that's happening under the ground so that way of taking Two opposing ends and bringing them together is a reflection of the opposing periphery and center of the archetype of the plant and the earth at the at the center. So this preparation then being unearthed from the ground is you'll see it teeming with um, with mycorrhizal, and it's it comes out uh, if done long enough or you know buried at the right depth it comes out smelling delicious and is a very um earthy smell crumbly uh you know you, you can tell that it's potentized that uh, it was it's gone on it's gone through a change uh this also being used in a homeopathic dose is then put into water it's like a tablespoon um, for like five gallons or so. It's it's not very much. 
um, we tend to put a little bit more in ours because we feel like the land needed it, needs it. <clears throat> but this this then goes through a stirring process, um, and this this is something that will become individual for each person. But it feels like an hour is a good amount of time. You add this preparation into preferably rainwater and it is stirred in one direction to form a, a um, an organized vortex for a minute and then that is thrust back on itself and stirred in the opposite direction also for a minute and then this process is repeated like I said for about an hour and in this process you will find a change in the water um, one of more like organization. At first, it it, it splashes a lot. You're going to get splashed in the face, and um, and it's it's not as organized as you begin to do it. The water seems to take on a more um, organized component. It's sometimes referred to as the fifth phase of water. This is then sprayed over the fields, like over your cultivated areas, and even beyond. Uh, in very minute doses, I like to refer to it as microdosing your your land. Uh, this is done in the early mornings. You want to be out there. Uh, I'm sorry. This is done in the evening, so that it is given time to. Uh, you you don't want it to evaporate. You want to get it onto the land and then be have time to be absorbed. Uh, and this is something that should be done on uh, repeated. Um, intervals and th and that kind of that process is somewhat I would say up to you but stick with it if you're you want to do it um, after a rain uh, like I said before at it, when it's wet um, you can you want to utilize the full moon because the full moon like we said before has a, a obvious effect on all the watery elements of the earth and it is it, it can also help to propel what you are doing further. Uh, like you're spraying minute doses on the land, but then that full moon activating the water, it's being able to penetrate more deeply. And with repeat sprays, um, you, you know, the benefits are... What Steiner says is... It, uh, and it seemed to suggest that he was aware of what mycelium was doing before mycelium was as um, studied as it was, but he says this will help bring in elements from beyond the cultivated space. It brings in elements, being that everything is connected under the ground, you're bringing in elements from your your woods, from your fields, from um, where the animals are grazing. So it's the horn manure preparation is helping bring the periphery down to the earth and allowing the plants to be to receive that um, radiation that's coming to them from the archetype in the cosmos. The cosmos not just being a place of stars and comets, but a, the, the home of spiritual beings. So that is a gravitational pull that you are providing the plant with the horn manure. The horn silica is the counterpart to the, the gravitational pull, and it would be the levitational pull. So this is finely ground quartz crystal that is made in the spring and is buried throughout the summer and winter, dug up in the fall. So this spray is then what you use to help the plant achieve its, its ripening, to allow it to... Uh, go through its fruit forming process, its flower forming process that you want. It's helping to allow what you are growing ripen in time and achieve the the health that it is uh, capable of getting. So you are as well spraying uh, using minute doses of finely ground quartz crystal in water, going through the same stirring process as you did for the horn manure, and then spraying this onto your plants in the early morning before sunrise or just at sunrise in that dawn time. Uh, and it is helpful to use a backpack sprayer 
For this one, when you apply the horn manure, we use a combination of different things like little uh, handheld brooms or uh, cedar branches tied together and you're kind of just flinging the water all over the place. I don't really like putting that mixture through a sprayer just because of the, the pressure that the water goes through, through the handle and through the whole process. Um, that doesn't feel as natural as just kind of flinging it from a bucket with, a, with some cedar branches. But the, the quartz spray, the, the horn silica, is much more conducive to being sprayed through a backpack sprayer. And you're trying to cover, you want to kind of fill, like fill in the aura of the plant. You're spraying above it, you're, and you can see it you're just kind of misting and then falling and mixing with the dew that's on the plants. Um, and as the sun's coming, it's a really beautiful, fun um, process to, to go through. And so the horn manure, you're spraying at the time in the spring to help get the roots established. The quartz, the horn silica, you're spraying in the early summer. Whenever, whatever you're growing, once you start to see the ripening fruits of what you're doing, you want to start spraying the quartz, the horn silica then. So... We often start our spray for the cannabis at the end of July, beginning of August. That's what we have found is when anthesis begins on the plants. And so from that point on, we're spraying, you know, every other week or like three to four times throughout the, the ripening season. Um, what have I missed? I was just going to mention a little bit like why the cow horn. Mm. And I think in general in biodynamics, cow horns are, are really important like um, in certification, you're not allowed to have cows without horns. And unfortunately, it's, uh, you know, it's a common practice to remove horns from cows. And the cow's horns are extremely important for the cows. Their sinuses actually go up into the horns. And um, in there is part of... Uh, uh, the cow, just in general, is this very sort of meditative very focused on digestive animal when you see it 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 ruminates you know that's where that whole word comes from it it eats its food but then after it does that it'll then sit down and start ruminating and it'll actually has four you know the cow has four chambers four chamber stomach and that food that it eats gets moved around into these four chambers actually comes back into the mouth after it's been eaten they continue to chew it and then goes back down. And all this process that happens within the stomach and uh, the sort of like the flavors and the taste and the digestion get circulated within the horns too. And it's kind of said that the horns have a bit of like the cow is kind of like the guru of the meditative guru of the, of the, animal world and it has sort of this connection the horns to to the cosmos the the horns and the hooves kind of contain are kind of the two ends of the of the animal that kind of contains this digestive process and has much more of that um solid sort of formative process and you know like uh pyramids and cones and that sort of thing kind of have this very uh the kind of formative condensing shape as far as uh, their what what they look like, and so putting manure into the into this vessel really creates that sort of um, kind of what we're talking about when you're stirring, kind of going from this chaos, this like very loose substance manure, and putting it to, into this highly highly formed, uh, very uh, complex thing that is that is the cow horn. And then you're also on top of a layer that goes on top of that is as you're stirring, you are able to imbue your own forces into the mixture. Like, it's very important to be aware of your thoughts as you're doing that. Um, and it's amazing to see how your thoughts can travel within that hour. But having an intention that you bring into what you're doing um, is, I, I, we feel, is definitely felt. And I think that, like, two of these preparations can be purchased 
um, from different biodynamic groups and um, or the Josephine Porter Institute. And um, I think that that's almost in a, in a way more important than making them is super important, but it's not something you have to do. But it, I think I'm so glad Daniel brought that up because it really is this meditative process that happens within the stirring. And I think just in general in biodynamics, your intention and your footprints and your presence on the land is so important. And I think that that, that spraying these preparations give you, gives you a moment to pause and to focus more on our sort of like mental intentional ways that we are uh, working with the land. And part of me, as we're, as we're talking about this, I'm trying to think about what people might be thinking about this. And I will bring up and, and just be honest that it was difficult to, and still somewhat is, it's something that I think about a lot, like how is it that we are taking this crystal from the earth and smashing it up, smashing it to pieces and then spraying it on our fields. Like there's an extractive element to that. And uh, Steiner has, says that by doing this, we are freeing up elemental beings. That the crystals are home of elemental beings. They're an impression that the earth has felt over time that we are then able to release. And this takes us down a really long rabbit hole of how what is going on with the mineralization of the earth and how we're transforming the mineral element of the earth the mineral realm is being transformed and not always with the best of intentions um but it is one to meditate on like how this fits into to that and i will just say that it feels I, I have come to peace with it a bit when this process is done in a way that we hope is serving nature and the ecology that surrounds us. Because there is a, a destructive element, it feels like, that you're taking a quartz crystal, a really beautiful, uh, symmetrical, divinely shaped thing, and then smashing it into pieces where the surface area is larger than the the whole of the plant we there's a mentor that we um uh engage with uh who gave an imp a demonstration of the of quartz crystal showing how he held the quartz and dropped it into his hand there's the gravity pull and then he crushed this thing up to a point it was in his hand he just blew on it and it just lifted up into the air in this uh way of demonstrating levity and so I just want to say that there is a um, tension that kind of exists in, in the, the horn uh, silica prep. Because manure is very available, you know, uh, feed your cow and you'll get something out of it. But the harvesting of quartz crystal is something that is a bit more uh, of, a, of a stretch. So I just wanted to, to bring that up. Right on. So, um, you know, so much of this preparation, I mean, I, I recognize parts of it um, as foliar prep, right? Just like things that I, I have done many times in different recipes. But then there is, then there are these additions that are, you know, stir it, you know, in, 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 in clockwise for... Um, you know, X amount of time and then, and then, and then immediately stir it the other way. And so, so that you're getting some of that chaos and then it, and then it reorganizes itself. And, and it's interesting because there really is a blending of organic practices that I recognize that I'm like, oh, I've done something that like that before. And then there, and then, and then suddenly you're talking about how the, the horn manure prep is, is an illustration of the beginning and the ending and completion of nature because since the horn is on the head of the cow and the, and the manure comes out the back end. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I thought I was in the, I was, you know, for a second there, I thought I was in the realm of, of scientific preparations that I know. And then now, now suddenly I'm in the dreaming, you know, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm doing a, an imaginative, energetic preparation that is causing me to, 
sit down and reflect and get manure on me and think about how it's not dirty. Like suddenly it gets like really big, a, a, a prep that sounds like something that I want to do to have my cannabis plants um, grow and my farm to be abundant and healthy has suddenly turned into you know, personal mysticism and personal growth. And I'm like, oh my God, there's so much here. And it kind of makes biodynamics like, I don't know, I, I guess um, I'll say a bit slippery and not in any disrespectful way. It's kind of like biodynamics is is kind of different for everybody where, where you learn biodynamics and, and it's, and it's this, it's collection of philosophies and preparations. And then after that, it's given to you. And then each farmer will make it their own based on their personal life experience. And like, I dare say what the farm tells them. And if I would, you know, if I would just say that to most groups of cannabis people, I think that um, I would get some eye rolls, but hearing you talk about it, um, you know, it sounds it sounds less like an eye roll and more like a like a spiritual practice that has meaning to each individual people, but maybe not in the same way to a group, and um, and. And that's the, I you know I find that to be a rare thing in cannabis, right? And um, and what so so what are your thoughts on that being as much of a spiritual practice as it is you know fertilizer? Uh, well, we ask a lot of our of the land. Um, it's I it doesn't feel comfortable for me to to expect the land to continue to provide without any sort of uh, recapitulation and ever since learning about these ideas and these practices it, it hasn't felt right for me to not do them um, the land provides it's abundant and it um, but it needs to be have something given back and if this and this is a small part of that but it does feel very important and it is very much a spiritual um, practice um, one that helps to connect us to the land us to the plants um, dare I say the cosmos and um, and I think yeah. uh, I, I, I kind of somewhat of a famous quote from Steiner is that um, you can never have a spirit without matter or matter without spirit and so I think that kind of sums up where where he's coming from and that um, we can't ignore the the unseen, but I think try to recognize and and embrace things that we can feel. Yeah, I like that idea. Things that we and can it, feel. You something that I just wanted to tag onto that when we were talking about the preparations, um, I failed to to bring nitrogen back into the the situ the the equation. We talked about the other. Uh, siblings, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur, but uh, nitrogen never came back up. And I was just reminded of it because he says that farmers should meditate, and it's very important for them to do so, but when, but be aware of actually what we are doing when we meditate. And he says that we're, we are growing into an experience of the nitrogen that surrounds you. Because we think of nitrogen as something that you need to feed to your plants in order for them to grow, but the nitrogen is there, what he says, as a way of, of, of allowing the other elements to work through the plant. And so when we sit down and meditate, we are growing into the nitrogen in the atmosphere, which there is a lot of, and then that is where we are able to get impressions from the farm and from the land that we might not have had we not taken the time to, to do that. And stirring 500 is a great uh, meditation, meditative practice. Um, and so, 
Yep, that's that's what I wanted to bring to that. Right on. So, you know, I'm sure there are people that are listening who are considering the the spiritual aspects, but then they they also actually want to do these preps. And um, so much of what we're doing in in regenerative and natural farming right now are you know a, you know variety of preps and fermentations. You know, a lot of them coming from Korean natural farming. How how does how do these preps play with the others? So, you know, from what I'm hearing from them, it actually sounds like they're all in the same gang, and and all these different preps can work together with the the other um, natural farming preps that that we might be more familiar with. But but mm, I bet I better ask because there might be some part of the the spiritual structure that makes that. Um, not as applicable. So, so how do these preps interact, uh, you know, and play nice with other natural farming techniques? I, I think they play great with each other. Um, I think that it's, you know, it's all, I, I feel like um, we don't practice very much Korean natural farming, but we do, we do do some other fermentations um, with plants and stuff. And so I, I don't think you should, like I would never say you should do one or the other. I don't believe that at all. And I think that it's important to grasp on all different kinds of 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 agriculture. And I think it's it I think things go wrong when you start to uh think you should only be farming a certain way and that I think it's important to gather from all different types of, of practices and, and utilize the ones that feel good good to you and you know that's you're you're creating your farm individual individuality and and creating the systems that work best for you right on so yeah, the horn manure is a way of um it's almost like a I, imo collection collection oh yeah it is, it is kind of like an imo for sure yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so there a lot of them are are sharing a lot of the same you know overall strategies, even though the form and certainly in this case the the spiritual intent is is certainly more involved. And so to kind of you know finish up the show with that you know I guess spiritual intent vibe, um, you know when I when I when I talked to you all before uh, our recording and and. And, and read some of the Steiner stuff. Everything seems to be very future focused. There seems to be a real awareness of, of inertia and that, you know, we, we know we're going to end up in the future. And so let's try to do something now. So the future is better. So, um, would you both take us out with a, a couple words on this idea of biodynamics as a vehicle towards the future? Because honestly, we just don't, we don't get a lot of that in a lot of the other, um, uh, farming traditions. For sure. And, um, uh, thank you for asking it. The, what really attracted me to biodynamics is that it does speak to us in a way that I had not found in other literature and other um, philosophies. And when, when we speak of the earth as a, as a living being, uh, that, that's something that can just kind of get said and then we move on to the next thing. But um, through familiarizing ourselves with Steiner's work, he is very much wanting to drive home that we are living on a highly developed spiritual being and the we are locked into this um direction towards the future of which we need we're here to learn lessons of how to make that future happen and the plants are one of our first teachers in doing so and so, when we work with the land, when we work with these imaginations that we find, the imaginations that give us the ideas of making these preparations, of putting these herbs into these vessels, when we work with these ideas, at first they can seem far out, and they are, but they start to bring up feelings that, that teach us lessons of, of, of where we're going. Um, the... And what is that? What is the lessons that the plants are trying to teach us? And what is being said is that when we learn to to um, when we learn to coexist with each other, the way plants coexist with each other, we will be in a place 
receptive to feel the love that we can freely give back to the Creator. And so, when we observe the way plants of different species grow next to each other and seem to be good companions for each other, we think of what's happening under the soil with the roots. We think of the communication that's going on. We feel, we see that there is this idea that one cannot be happy if the other is not happy. And we learn how plants are able to help bring in uh, nutrients from afar if, if someone, if a different plant needs it. We see this communication that is done out of the uh, um, freely given, like a, a, a gift economy, so to speak, right? Like we do this as a way, uh, as an offering. And um, I believe that very wholeheartedly that when we engage with the land, when we're farming, we are not just farming to uh, um, create like substance for us to eat. We are ma beautifying the surroundings that our senses will gain nourishment just as much as we gain fuel uh, to, to exist. Um, we need to eat, but we also need to absorb beauty and kindness. And biodynamics is what awoke me to these ideas and these imaginations. And it goes on from there. Then once we uh, exit the, um, the plant realm, we attain the animal consciousness where we learn to feel into the other being. And then we move on to only will we be truly human when we are able to understand the ego of another um, as we understand our own. And it, gets, uh, it goes on from there. But um, I do believe what biodynamics has to offer beyond other philosophies is this larger picture that we're dealing with things more than just elements, more than just nutrients. We're dealing with transformation, metamorphosis, and growth uh, that will bring us into the next stages of, of spiritual, um, spiritual development and the next evolution of the earth that we are all caught up in. Well, certainly, um, I think that all of us who are regenerative farmers and, and I don't know, probably the, the, all of us who, who participate in the very soul of the cannabis plant, um, would share this idea of, um, you know, em, em, embracing the interaction with spirit and with nature now and expressing our love in ways that, I don't know, nurture and bless the future. And um, whether, no matter the words that we use to express that idea, um, it can only be good. And, um, and I'm grateful that, that biodynamics as a, you know, as a, as a farming philosophy and, and as, as I'm learning is more of a, more of a life philosophy as much as it is a farming philosophy. Um, you know, it's nice to have some of that importance uh, injected into our farming um, in a day and age where there are so many pressures to encourage farmers to look at their farm as commodities and uh, and as and as purely as a food dispensing device. So. So with that, I think that uh, we will wrap up for today. Um, thank you so much to both of you for sharing um, your time and um, your experience. But but in this particular show, thank you very much for I don't know um, letting the you know pulling aside the veil and sharing some of the aspects of of this you know biodynamic spirituality in your farming, which as you said is not necessarily invited everywhere all the time that you talk about farming so so thank you for for being vulnerable that's 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 the feeling i'm going for thank you for your vulnerability and sharing with us um the your heart behind um your farm uh processes thanks so much for having us shango it's a pleasure to talk to you and uh really appreciate what you're able to share on your show and and uh yeah really appreciate what you do yeah, thank you, Shango. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I really, 
uh, felt comfortable and uh, it seems I feel like you're a very important voice in the regenerative cannabis community so I appreciate all you do and uh, appreciate you taking the time to invite us on here today. Right on. Thank you very, both so much. So, dear listener, if um, <clears throat> if you want to learn more about um, biodynamic growing, but <clears throat> even more so how these ideals can be expressed um, in your own cannabis cultivation, I encourage you to follow the Radical Herbs uh, Instagram, and as I mentioned in the introduction, that's radical with a with the, not necessarily the the spelling that you would ex, uh, expect. So it's radical, like uh, like the taproot radical. So it's R A D I C L E herbs. H e r b s. So it's radical herbs on Instagram, and you can follow along with uh, Blair and Daniel uh, on their farm, and um, and 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 see examples, and also see their fantastic herb that comes out of the farm. Um, if you fi- want to find out more about the farm itself, um, their website is also delightful and has got information, and that is also at radicalherbs.com. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you would leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news, exclusive videos, and giveaways. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. Be sure to follow on Instagram for all original content not found on the podcast. That's at Shaping Fire and at Shango Los on Instagram. Be sure to check out the Shaping Fire YouTube channel for exclusive interviews, farm tours, and cannabis lectures. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los.